Thank you for joining COMPASS, Directions for Caregivers Following the Diagnosis. Banner Alzheimer's Institute is dedicated to ending Alzheimer's disease before another generation is lost. But as passionately, we're as interested in setting a new standard of care for patients who are affected by dementia and their family members. At the same time, we are forging biomedical collaborations and community collaborations to improve care for people who are affected by Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. To learn more about Banner Alzheimer's Institute, we invite you to visit our website at www.banneralz.org. We have created this COMPASS program to help caregivers find success and solutions in caring for someone who's affected by dementia because we know that caregiving can be tough and that there is nothing logical about living with a dementia. So today's session, we're gonna be discussing what is dementia and how is it different from Alzheimer's disease. We're gonna talk about the progression of Alzheimer's disease most specifically and talk about how treatment is managed through the diagnosis. We will take you through a variety of roadblocks that are likely to happen, these problems that come up unexpectedly. At the same time, we're gonna explore detours, that is, how can you navigate around some of these difficult challenges that you might face. And at the same time, we're gonna provide you some rules for the road so that you can be successful as a caregiver. Let's begin by talking about what is dementia. First of all, it's important to understand that dementia is really an umbrella term, meaning kind of a catch-all phrase that's really not a specific diagnosis rather than a syndrome describing a number of changes that could be taking place in the person's brain that affects daily function. For example, many times we think about dementia as affecting memory, and in fact it does so in something like Alzheimer's disease. So we see changes in short-term memory that in fact impairs their ability to remember things and might lead to repetitiveness. For some individuals, they develop more difficulty with language, and that can include word finding, but it also can include those who had difficulty understanding the spoken language. For some, there are changes in their brain that lead to changes in personality and behavior and can go on and affect judgment and reasoning and cause differences in how a person behaves. All of these things can go on to cause what we call a dementia. Again, non-specific term. I often like to make the analogy that it's much like talking about cancer. Cancer is really a non-specific term, and in fact, when we hear that someone has cancer, the next question we ask is, what type is it? Well, the same thing it goes with dementia. When we hear that a person has dementia, we will likely say, what type of dementia is it? So let's explore the different types of dementia that exist in this umbrella category. As you will see within the umbrella, there are probably about 100 different types of dementia, but what we're going to discuss are the most common types that people are more likely to be diagnosed with. So for those individuals who are diagnosed with a vascular dementia, these are individuals who could have a single stroke or more likely a series of small strokes over time that affect memory and thinking and will impair a person's ability to manage independently in daily life. What we've learned about individuals with vascular dementia though is that they are often at risk for also developing Alzheimer's disease. As we understand what the risk factors are for vascular dementia, they include poorly controlled high blood pressure, individuals who have high cholesterol, or those who have diabetes often that has been poorly managed. Because these chronic conditions can uh, lead to difficulties, we can in fact see people at risk for developing these small strokes over time. At the same point, we also want to recognize that high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and poorly controlled diabetes are also risk factors for accelerating the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So it's not uncommon for people who have vascular dementia also to have Alzheimer's disease co-occurring in the brain. When that happens and the physicians believe that is the cause, we are likely to call it a mixed dementia. There's a category of illnesses called frontal temporal dementia or degeneration. 
and this really describes the area in the brain that a disease might be striking. When the disease strikes the frontal portion of the lobe, we are likely to see changes largely in social behaviors and decision making. In fact, the frontal lobe is a really important part of our brain. We often call it the executive center, meaning it's the CEO of you. It's how you make decisions. It's how you use logic and reason. It's how you control your social behavior so that you keep unwanted, unfiltered words to yourself rather than blurting them out. It's what keeps you from accelerating and wanting to hit a driver who was just rude to you. All of those things happen in your frontal lobe. So when we see individuals develop these frontal temporal dementias, particularly when it's in the frontal lobe, we're likely to hear more of a history that a person's social behavior is changing in a way that's unacceptable, and that in fact does affect daily life. On the other hand, we have individuals who have a disease that will strike the temporal lobe of the brain. And this part of the brain is really important in terms of language. So we have some individuals, for example, who have very difficult time with language production. For example, recently I provided some memory screening to a 58-year-old woman who had a master's degree. And one of the tests that we asked her what to do was to uh, create as many words that she could think of within one minute that began with a certain letter. Over the course of one minute, this woman was only able to produce four words. I think you would agree that this is a tremendous difficulty. And in fact, she went on to be diagnosed with a disease we call primary progressive aphasia that falls into this category of frontal temporal dementia. At the same time, we have seen individuals who have more difficulty with understanding language. And clearly, if we don't understand language, living daily life in a normal way is going to be very difficult. The next area of disease that we're going to spend a tremendous amount of time is that of Alzheimer's disease. And I think at this point what's important to know about Alzheimer's disease is that we call it a disease of memory, meaning that memory are typically the symptoms that we're more likely to hear from family members. We're often going to hear that over time that person's short-term memory has been fading that they've been asking the same questions repeatedly. Perhaps they've been losing objects in their home. Perhaps this person is having more difficulty learning new materials. And what initially might have seemed to be what we call senior moments, meaning, well, you know, initially it was happening to him or her as much as it was to me, the spouse. Now I see over some period of time that, in fact, this memory issue is, in fact, worsening but more to come about Alzheimer's disease. Finally, in the category of Lewy body dementia, this is an interesting illness where the person almost possesses symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which we often associate with kind of that shuffling gait or that trembling hand, about the same time that they develop mild memory issues. Don't seem to be quite as severe, however, as Alzheimer's disease. What we do set, tend to see happen with Lewy body dementia so as we begin to hear a history of what we call recurrent hallucinations, that means that this individual is seeing things that aren't there, and they're very real to that person. We also see a lot of fluctuation in day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week functioning. So when the days are bad, they're really bad, often sleeping more and, and seeing things that aren't there. And when the days are good, they actually seem relatively normal. So this fluctuation of this disease also gives us additional clues. These again just begin to point out a few types of the most prominent types of dementia, but keep in mind that almost two-thirds of all dementias are of the Alzheimer's type. So in summary, dementia is an umbrella term that describes changes in memory and thinking functions that can affect behavior and judgment that impair a person's ability to live independently. Alzheimer's disease, the most common type of dementia, so that while every person with Alzheimer's disease has dementia, not every person with dementia has Alzheimer's disease. So as we think about these disease changing over time, and all of these dementias, in fact, are progressive at this point, there is no cure. And at best, we're working with symptomatic treatment.
it's important to keep in mind that typically these diseases categorically will change over some seven to ten years. However, some individuals will be affected by an illness that could go very rapidly, die within two years of the diagnosis, and others might dis their disease might progress quite slowly, living up to 20 years following the diagnosis. It's important that we talk about the stages of the illness as often we stage cancer, well, we often stage dementia, but in a very different way. So for example, we call early stage Alzheimer's disease mild dementia for people with other forms of dementia. We talk about the middle stage of Alzheimer's disease that could also be called the moderate stage. And finally, the late stage of Alzheimer's disease we often refer to as advanced or severe dementia. And we're gonna detail each of these stages in just a moment. You'll see that early stage disease typically lasts in general about one to three years, where the moderate stage will last somewhere between two to five years. And finally, the advanced stage could last about one to three years. These are just generalities, not specifics. I like to think of the mild, moderate and advanced terms as also indicating in the early stages someone needs a mild amount of help. In the moderate stage they're going to need a moderate amount of help from caregivers and in the advanced stage they're going to need full care from caregivers. Most importantly it's important to remember that the different stages of the illness are going to require different strategies from you and different services. So what works today likely won't work next year and probably won't be effective five years from now. So we're gonna adjust these strategies and find different kinds of services as the disease progresses. Now that we've learned a little bit more about what dementia is, we wanna focus in and learn a little bit more about Alzheimer's disease. And I think this is really important because Alzheimer's is a difficult disease to understand in your loved ones. What becomes so challenging is that you can't look at the person and see that something is going on with them. You're seeing these behavior changes and these personality changes, but you look and they look like the same individual. So to understand what's happening with Alzheimer's disease, we need to have a, a neurology 101 lesson here. And your brain is actually made up of over 100 billion neurons. And they connect to each other and they communicate with each other through connections called synapses. So when we talk about what is Alzheimer's disease, the two abnormal structures that are forming are called plaques and tangles. And one of those structures damages the synapses, those connections, and then the other part of Alzheimer's disease is a tangle which damages the neurons. So if you look at the image on your slide right now, that is a brain with Alzheimer's disease. You can see those big clumped structures that are forming, those are plaques. And those are doing exactly what they look like they're doing. They are gunking up those synapses, they're blocking those connections so that those synapses aren't able to fire and communicate with other neurons anymore. You know, we talk about use it or lose it for our bodies, the same is true for our minds as well. If we're not able to, if those synapses aren't able to fire and make those connections, it's going to disconnect and now you've lost that. The other part of Alzheimer's disease is called a tangle and that happens within the actual neuron. And those are the bigger structures in that image right there. Inside of a normal, healthy neuron, there are nice straight lines that flow through it. The information, the nutrition, the oxygen flow through that neuron and keep it healthy. When a tangle gets a hold of a neuron, it does exactly what it does to our hair. It knots those straight lines up. And now no oxygen and no nutrition are getting to that neuron. And so ultimately that neuron is not going to be able to survive. Alzheimer's is a progressive disease starting in one area of the brain and progressing to all different domains of the brain. And so that causes those changes that you see through the stages. Watching the video on this next slide, these were images compiled by some of our expert researchers here at Banner Alzheimer's Institute. And what's so fascinating about this video as you watch it go through, you can watch how the plaques spread through the brain and see how it just systematically moves through someone's mind. Go ahead and we'll watch the video again now, and I want you to pay attention to when that green line changes to red. And actually at that point, that is when someone becomes symptomatic for Alzheimer's disease. 
That is when those outward symptoms start showing. So what's so interesting about Alzheimer's is it actually starts forming in someone's mind two decades before any of those outward symptoms start showing. Those plaques and those tangles have been forming and destroying those neurons. When we talk about Alzheimer's disease, we talk about it having various stages that people progress through. The important part with these stages is to know that sometimes people seem to fluctuate through the stages. They can seem to be moderate stage one minute or one day and early stage the next day. It's hard to sometimes pinpoint exactly where your loved one is in the disease process. So what is important is not what stage the person is in. What becomes of paramount importance is they are living with the maximum dignity and the maximum quality of life they possibly can, no matter what stage they seem to be in at that time. With that being said though, people do take a lot of comfort in being able to say, I believe my loved one has early stage Alzheimer's disease. So we'll go through and kind of give you some of the hallmarks of what you would see in these stages. And the hallmark of early stage Alzheimer's disease is short term memory loss. And as you see on the image of the brain that's on your slide, that blue area in the brain is where Alzheimer's has started forming. And it starts forming in an area of your brain called your hippocampus. Your hippocampus is your short term memory bank. It takes in all of the information throughout the day and its job is to say, this is important information, I'm going to save this for later. And this is not important information, I'm just going to forget about it. So initially, that is where Alzheimer's starts damaging someone's mind, which is why we see these short-term memory problems. People will start repeating themselves, asking the same question over and over again, or telling the same story that they have already told you 10 times this afternoon. It's because they simply cannot remember they have just told you that, or they have just asked you that. They can also start misplacing things as well, which really lends itself to that short-term memory problem. I'm sure we can all think of an instance where we came home and put something down in a place that it wasn't supposed to go and said, I'll remember where I put that, and then we forget all about it. Well, unfortunately, with Alzheimer's disease, that happens to them more and more frequently as time goes on. They place something in somewhere that they think that they're going to remember it, but then that save button in their brain now has become a delete button, so they simply can't remember where they've placed it. Also in the early stages, you'll see changes in executive functioning as well, which as was discussed earlier, that's kind of the CEO of your brain. And so you can start to see decreased judgment in someone. Maybe they were incredible with paying their bills on time. They would never be taken by telemarketers. And now all of a sudden you have massive deliveries from the home shopping network. It's because they're seeing that decrease in judgment. You also may see a decrease in initiative in your loved one. Sometimes people with Alzheimer's, you'll start to see them kick back and start to withdraw from things that they used to be a part of. And what we really don't want you to do is to just chalk this up to Alzheimer's disease and say they have Alzheimer's and they just don't want to do anything anymore. A lot of times what is happening is that individual, is that executive function portion, isn't controlling things for them anymore and so that initiative in them has gone down. So they may still want to do these tasks, their brain just doesn't tell them how to do it for them anymore. They may have difficulty problem solving as well. We give them a new puzzle to solve or a new issue has come up in their life that wouldn't have been a problem in the past but now they are just not able to work through it. They can start to have difficulty with familiar tasks, with managing those finances as I talked about earlier, or preparing meals, or keeping their house clean. Things that were never a problem in the past now are starting to become more and more challenging for them. Even in the early stages, we can start to see problems with language as well. And as this progresses, this is just going to become more and more prominent for them. More specifically, what we see in early stage Alzheimer's is trouble with word finding. And even more specifically than that, people seem to struggle with nouns. Coming up with that person, place, or thing, they just can't pull that forward in their mind anymore. They may start to become disoriented with time as well. Sometimes people with Alzheimer's disease will completely flip-flop their sleep schedules, so they are sleeping all day long and they're up all night long. It doesn't have to be a daily disorientation with time either. Uh, maybe they want to go on a walk 
and they put on their winter coat and jacket and it's actually the middle of summer and they head out the door. They have lost their place in time. It really starts to become a foreign concept for them. You may also start to see changes in mood, in their behavior, in their personality. You know, there's a really common phrase that floats around the Alzheimer's world, and it's if you know one person with Alzheimer's disease, you know one person with Alzheimer's disease. While we give you all of these um, techniques and strategies and we talk about the changes you may be seeing in your loved one, I would encourage you to think creatively about how maybe symptoms that you're seeing fit in with the changes that we're talking about. Because we can give you examples all day long about how we've seen Alzheimer's disease in individuals that we know, and your stories can be completely different from ours. Along those lines too, in the early stages, people may start to have difficulty in a crowd. There is a lot of noise and a lot of information that your brain is having to process when you're out and about in public. And so that can really start to become challenging for them and you may start to see them withdrawal or not want to go out and about in public as much anymore. When it comes to early stage Alzheimer's disease, what we really want to focus on is maintaining independence. And our jobs as family members and caregivers of people with this disease is really to keep a watchful eye over them, make sure things are still happening and functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. A great analogy for your role as a caregiver is we don't want to sit across the table from that person. We want to sit next to them. We want to be partners with them and help them navigate through this disease process. Some changes that you may see in day-to-day -day function in the early stages include changes in handling finances. Like I talked about earlier, challenges getting the bills paid. Maybe you're seeing them start to pile up on the desk when they used to handle that task without a problem. You may also start to see changes in their abilities to take their medications. Maybe they're not able to remember to do that anymore, so you're having to remind them more often to do that. Housekeeping may be another task that you see changes in. They're not able to keep up on that housework anymore. Independent travel as well. In the early stages, it's important to know that driving can become hazardous for that person. For the same reason that we were talking about earlier, a lot of information is coming in that your brain is having to process when you're driving your car. And so even in the early stages, all of that information can become too much for that individual. So independent traveling, driving, again, may become hazardous or they may start to get lost in familiar situations. Shopping is another function that you may see changes in as well. Also preparing meals, they may not remember to prepare that meal. A lot of these changes that you'll see really lend themselves back to that first change that we talked about with early stage, that short-term memory problem. You know, preparing a meal is something that we all have done our entire lives, but there's a lot of steps that our brain is in charge of behind the scenes that we don't really give it credit for. We need to be able to get out the ingredients that we want to use, get out the bowls, turn on the oven, and put all the ingredients together in the right order. And probably most importantly in all of that, we need to remember what we've done and what we haven't done. So preparing meals and consuming meals can be something that they really do have difficulty with. And then lastly, using the telephone can become challenging. Without having that face-to-face -face contact, it can become very confusing for that person to try to discern who they're talking to or what exactly is happening in that situation. As someone with Alzheimer's disease progresses more into the middle stages or the moderate stages of disease, you're again going to see more changes in their functioning. Some things that you might notice in them are changes in memory. Not only is the short-term memory impacted, as was within the early stage, long-term memory is also going to be impacted as well. If you see the image of the brain on the slide, that blue area that was in a very small section of the brain in the early stage, you can see now has progressed to cover more and more areas of the brain. So not only are we gonna see changes in memory, but also in communication as well. Middle stage is very difficult on the individual with the disease. They're going to have more challenges telling you what their wants and their needs and their thoughts are, but they're also going to have difficulty understanding what you're trying to express back to them. We're also at this point going to see changes in their senses as well. They're going to start to misinterpret information. 
And this is such a challenge for loved ones of people with this disease that we're going to address this a little bit later on in the program. But really brought in your minds to the fact that when we talk about information with Alzheimer's disease, we're not just talking about what is coming in through your ears. We're talking about everything that is coming in through the five senses as being information that your brain is having to process. In the middle stage as well, they may start to become disoriented not only to time, like was in the early stage, but also to place. We're also going to start to see more impairment in their judgment and their problem-solving abilities, changes in their personality and their behavior as well. So when we talked about early stage, it was more those outward tasks that we are starting to see problems with. Now that they've progressed to the more moderate stage, it's more daily living tasks that they're going to start to have trouble with. So our goal within the moderate stage is, as family members and caregivers of people with this disease, is to help that person live with assistance. So some challenges that you may see in the moderate stage would maybe be in grooming. Now they're going into the shower and they don't know how to turn on the water and all of those bottles in the tub just don't make sense anymore and now they have put shaving cream on their toothbrush and are trying to brush their teeth. You may also start to see challenges in dressing. And throughout the progression of the disease, it becomes really important that we continually adapt to their changing abilities. So in early stage, maybe they were just fine with picking out their clothing and dressing themselves. We just needed to make sure it was appropriate for the weather. Now that they've progressed into the more moderate stage, we also not only need to monitor for the appropriateness of the weather, but monitor that they're putting things on in the correct order. So maybe they walk into their closet and there's just too many choices. So to modify that, we walk out and say, would you like to wear this or this today and give them two options. Another thing that you may see is they're putting their clothes on in the wrong order. They come out with their underwear over their pants. And so to adapt for that, we lay the clothes out in the order that they're going to put them on. Bathing, too, can become a challenge, and toileting. That information that we talked about earlier, it's not just what's coming in, it's also what's within. And so those sensations that we have when we know it's time to head down the hallway, they're not making sense to them anymore. That nonverbal cue doesn't quite compute for them. They may also start to have trouble eating. And again, we need to modify throughout the course of the disease. And so maybe we're offering them smaller meals throughout the day. And also walking can become a challenge too. When someone progresses into the late stage of the disease, this is where there is really severe memory loss, severe deficits in all areas of functioning. The image of the brain that you're looking at right now you can see that blue area has consumed the entire cerebral cortex at this point. Communication in the late stages is going to be reduced to single words or sounds. This is really where nonverbal communication is going to become really important for you. And in the late stage as well, they're going to become oriented only to themselves. And that's something that I would encourage you to keep in mind throughout the progression of this disease people becoming more and more focused just on themselves. It's almost as if their world is kind of becoming smaller and smaller as the disease progresses. When it comes to caring for someone in late stage, we talk a lot about comfort care, and we really need to anticipate their needs throughout the course of the disease, but especially in the late stage. In their day-to-day -day functions, they're going to start to become completely reliant on others for their self-care. They're not going to be able to do those daily living tasks anymore, and so it becomes up to the caregivers to take those over for them. They'll also probably become incontinent in the late stage and pretty much have no independent self-care tasks at that point. Now that we've finished discussing the progression of Alzheimer's disease, let's move to talk about treatment that's available. In this next graphic, you're going to see how we treat early stage Alzheimer's disease, how it differs from moderate Alzheimer's disease, and then finally, late stage or advanced Alzheimer's disease. In the early stage, once a diagnosis has been confirmed by a physician, 
he or she is likely to start the person on a drug from a category of drugs called cholinesterase inhibitors. That's a big word, but essentially these drugs that are in the form of Aricept, also known as Dinepazil, Exelon, known as Ravastigmine, and Razidine, known as Galantamine, all essentially do the same thing. These drugs are trying to boost the production of a very important chemical messenger in the brain that we call acetylcholine. And our goal of using these drugs is not curative rather than symptomatic treatment of Alzheimer's disease. What that means is that we're trying to preserve and enhance overall what I call motor memory, the memory to remember how to carry out activities of daily life for a longer period of time. And we'll talk about that in greater detail in a moment. In addition to using one of the treatments of Aricept, Exelon, or Razadine, we're also going to be concerned about managing other chronic conditions. So it's important to recognize that many older adults are impacted by Alzheimer's disease and likely to have other chronic conditions. So for example, if an individual has high blood pressure, it's important that we manage blood pressure very carefully. Likewise, if diabetes uh, is present, we're going to manage blood sugars as effectively as possible as swings in blood sugar certainly can affect overall memory and thinking abilities. Finally, we talked some about the changes that can occur in mood and personality. It's important to recognize that depression actually can co-occur and about 60% of people who are affected by Alzheimer's disease. Therefore, mood management is really important. And having a chemical boost from the use of an antidepressant can really be helpful in terms of dealing with things like lack of initiative or something we call apathy, or even many times the irritability that might come with the frustration of living with Alzheimer's disease. In the moderate stage of the illness, the person should be on a stable dose of a cholinesterase inhibitor, Aricept, Exelon, and Razadine. And these doses are now changing as we're trying to use larger doses to see if we can get improved effect. In addition, your physician provider is likely to add on a drug called Nemenda, also known as Memantine. This works in a different area of chemical functioning within the brain and typically has a synergistic effect with a cholinesterase inhibitor. What that means is actually the use of Aricept, Exelon, or Razadine gets a boost when we add on Nemenda. However, the drugs can be used in combination, but they can also be used separately. As in the early stage of the illness, when there are chronic conditions, we continue to manage them as aggressively as possible. Again, the goal of managing the other chronic conditions is that they can have a direct impact on memory and thinking, and our goal is helping that person to live as successfully as they can with this memory loss condition. Once again, mood and behavior can be affected. Depression can continue, and often in the person with moderate stage Alzheimer's disease, it's not uncommon to see high levels of anxiety. So specifically, caregivers will often say, I can't even go to the bathroom, and he's standing at the door waiting for me to come out. Or I'll leave him a note saying, I'm just running out to the store. I'll be back in 15 minutes. And I come back, and he says, where have you been? You've been gone for hours. Again, that's an example of the anxiety that can, can co-occur due to depressed symptoms and really trouble understanding and managing time concepts. Antidepressants can often be very helpful in the treatment of both depression and anxiety. For some individuals, as you learned, this middle stage of the illness is very challenging. Again, the brain is, is changing in very dynamic ways that doesn't make sense to us, and it certainly doesn't make sense to them. These brain changes can lead to tricks and often disturbances. So making a person think that perhaps their spouse is cheating on them, or perhaps that someone is trying to harm them in some way. Perhaps they think that they're being visited by a stranger or that a dead parent is back. These can be very distressing symptoms for some, and so it's important to work with your medical provider to figure out how can we understand this behavior and is medication warranted. Finally, in the last stage of the illness, the late stage, we're likely to continue on with the use of cholinesterase inhibitors. Again, that is either Aricept, Exelon, or Razadine, as well as Nemenda. 
and typically we will continue on with those medications until the person is no longer walking independently. However, we continue to learn that some individuals, even with very advanced dementia, still benefit from using these medications. So again, a discussion will need to take place between you as the caregiver and the person's medical provider to determine is there benefit with continued use. If the two of you decide together that perhaps the medications are no longer of benefit, you should work with that physician provider to slowly titrate the person off the medication to really appreciate if the medication was working or not. Likewise, just as in early and moderate stage disease, it is possible with advanced dementia to experience depression. And so as a caregiver, you come to know what your person's nonverbal communication tells you. You can often tell through the look of the eye or perhaps more withdrawal, increased sleep, which is common with advanced dementia, that perhaps depression is occurring or worsening. Likewise, we get very concerned about pain in advanced dementia. And it's not that Alzheimer's disease causes pain, rather it's the disuse of the body. So as the person becomes more immobile, when we go to mobilize or move that person, whether we turn them in bed or whether we try to stand them up from sitting for hours in a chair to transfer them perhaps to a toilet, this person is likely to experience discomfort. And anybody over 50 knows what I'm talking about. Being stationary for too long when we go to move causes discomfort. And it's not that pain requires the use of morphine, Often simple Tylenol is really effective. But again, as a caregiver, you're going to want to keep tabs on that and provide that kind of feedback to your medical provider. So we're really looking at strategies that look at the overall comfort, as was just discussed previously. Finally, hospice care really becomes a must for people who suffer from Alzheimer's disease. We know that, in fact, Alzheimer's disease is a leading cause of death, perhaps the third leading cause of death in older adults. So as individuals are diagnosed at later ages, the likelihood of them dying with or from Alzheimer's disease is much more prominent. Therefore, thinking about hospice is simply essential. It's a Medicare health benefit that is there for individuals and families who are facing a life-limiting illness, which certainly Alzheimer's disease becomes in the late stages. Fabulous Medicare benefit that provides a team of experts in end-of-life care to manage comfort symptoms. So when in doubt, ask your medical provider for a hospice referral. In this next slide, let's talk a little bit more about medication for Alzheimer's disease. I often like to put in perspective what these medications do and what these medications don't do. Again, I wanna come back and emphasize that currently there is no effective treatment and there is no cure for Alzheimer's disease. Rather, these are symptomatic treatment for symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And yet, these medications do have a place and can have modest effect for many individuals. So as we look at this particular graphic, and on the left, we see the axis that says function, and on the bottom, the horizontal, we see the axis that looks at time, progression over time, as I click the slide, you will see this red bar. And this really represents the decline that happens in Alzheimer's disease and frankly, in all forms of dementia. So we see people going from a high level of functioning to complete dependency that is, was outlined earlier in advanced dementia. So when a physician prescribes a cholinesterase inhibitor, Exelon, Aricept, or Razodyne, this next little dotted line that you see you can see that there's a bump in function. However, if you're like me and you looked at that without knowing, you would think, really? This is all the benefit I'm getting? I don't know if it's even worth my copay. But if we begin to think about this dotted line being a difference in function, so imagine the top in the mild stage of the illness, the top dotted line means that I still can drive my car independently. And hey, if it's only for six months, six months is a lot when you're living with Alzheimer's disease compared to the red line, which means I've lost my driver's license, I didn't pass the test. As we move down the graphic, perhaps it means that I can still participate in my bridge club because I can remember enough that my lady friends ask me back, where the red line below means they're not asking me back. 
Perhaps as I get a little further in my illness, the top dotted line means that I'm able still to make a meal pretty well by myself. Sometimes my husband might have to come in and provide some reminders. But now the red line means he's taken over the cooking because I've just ruined too many meals. As we move into the moderate stage, it's often marked by changes in a person's ability to groom themselves. Well, I don't know about you, but I'd like to continue to groom myself for as long as I can. And I'd rather have the gentle reminder from my husband being the top dotted line versus the red. He's now leading me into the bathroom and trying to prompt me to put on my makeup and do my hair before we go out. Likewise, as we move into the progression, it means that on the top line, I'm more likely to pick up my clothes appropriately, which I would prefer to do versus now he's picking them out for me. And so it goes with eating. Perhaps the top line means I can still manipulate my knife and my fork and cut my own food. And the bottom line now means that my husband's cutting it for me. As we move into the advanced stage, it means the difference for me walking longer independently versus becoming wheelchair bound. So as one begins to think about the functional decline, I don't know about you, but I choose function. And in fact, that's what we're trying to do with these medications is preserve what we call motor memory. So now as I click on and you see this staggered dotted line, that really represents adding on this drug that we call Nemenda or Memantine. As I say, it's been FDA approved for the treatment of moderate to advanced disease. However, there are individuals with mild Alzheimer's disease who will also take Nemenda. Again, this is not cookbook medicine, and we ask that you talk to your physician. However, when the studies were done using these drugs, we found that, in fact, there was statistically significant improvement in function for those people who were on Nemenda in the moderate stage versus in the early stage. And we continue to see kind of a slower slope of decline, and yet there is decline. So a common question we often get, well, they're still getting worse. How do I know the drugs are working? Well, that's a really important discussion that we encourage families to continue to have with a physician. And when in doubt, and you want to consider withdrawing the medications, we highly recommend that you do it in partnership with your medical provider and not on your own. We've had clients who have chosen to just stop the medications thinking there was no benefit, and it's almost like the person walked off the side of a cliff. It can be quite dramatic how quickly change takes place. We have a very limited time to see if we can gain that function back. So again, in summary, these medications are not miracle cures, but they can have a moderate benefit in people who are being treated by Alzheimer's disease. So we hope you'll appreciate the role that they play. Let's talk now a little bit about additions to standard treatment. And that is, what role does clinical trials play in the treatment of people affected by Alzheimer's disease? Again, at Banner Alzheimer's Institute, we are dedicated to finding solutions to Alzheimer's disease before another generation is lost. As such, we have a variety of studies for people with memory difficulties. And in fact, at any given time, we're evaluating some 10 to 20 new medications that might be helpful in treating individuals who have Alzheimer's disease or even those with mild cognitive impairment, which we often call a pre-Alzheimer's state. But to learn more about these clinical trials, we'd encourage you to visit our website or to call the number listed on your screen and talk to a representative on our clinical trials team to learn more about new treatments for Alzheimer's disease. At the same time, we have studies for people without memory difficulties. And in fact, we're seeing more and more individuals who have had family members either experiencing the disease or having died from the disease who are very concerned about themselves as well. So in fact, we have drug studies that are evaluating new treatments for preventing Alzheimer's disease. Again, these studies are targeting people at greatest risk, meaning that they have a genetic risk, and with advancing age, often individuals over 65. We also have some natural history studies and brain imaging studies that are very helpful to us to understand the biology of the illness. Again, as you saw the graphic earlier showing how Alzheimer's disease spreads over time, in fact, much of this data comes from individuals who are involved in these brain imaging studies. Again, to learn more about prevention trials, we'd ask you to call the number on the screen and talk to a clinical research representative. 
Finally, in our efforts toward ending Alzheimer's disease, we have crafted a very wonderful registry called the Alzheimer's Prevention Initiative. And essentially, this is a registry that is designed to keep people interested in Alzheimer's disease treatment and care up to date with the latest. So all we need to do is, number one, sign up. Go to endallsnow.org and simply give your email address. It's as simple as that. And then from there, you're going to get periodic emails from us updating you on the latest in treatment. And if you choose to participate, you can be called up. Someone will explain a study to you, and you can determine if it's right for you. So we invite you to, again, go to www.endallsnow.org and join today. Now that we've learned a little bit about the medication treatments that we can use to treat Alzheimer's disease, you're probably left wondering, so how am I really going to manage this illness and this person that I care about? At Banner Alzheimer's Institute, we've developed a list of seven roadblocks that you might run into with this disease. As in regular life, when you run into a roadblock, you need to have a way to detour around it. So we will go through these seven roadblocks and then give you strategies for how to work around or work through these challenges that you're running into with this disease. The roadblocks that we might face are related to fatigue, change, too much demand, overwhelming or misleading stimuli, communication, activities, and lastly, illness. So the first roadblock that we might run into is that of fatigue. And this happens for a couple reasons. First of all, people with Alzheimer's disease are using more energy to complete the same tasks. Their brains are having to find new ways to old information as Alzheimer's is destroying those neurons. So it's just simply going to take them more energy than it did in the past. Another reason for this is they also have a lower tolerance for stress. Again, that information that is coming into them can provide prompt heightened anxiety within them and more stress. So what can we do if we're running into this roadblock that is fatigue? The detour that we can take, we have a variety of strategies. First of all, we need to learn our person's best time of day. Most people with Alzheimer's will have an ebb and a flow that's generally predictable in their energy levels throughout the day. So get to know those energy peaks and valleys. And so if you know two o'clock in the afternoon is a valley, your person gets incredibly tired at that time, we don't schedule going to the doctor's appointment then. We don't schedule going to the beauty shop. We want to schedule that when that's at a peak time of day, when they're at their best. Another strategy that we'll need to use throughout the course of the illness is to have shorter activities for that person. Generally, we talk about in the early stages, someone being able to tolerate activities two to probably at a maximum three hours of length. When they progress more into the moderate stage, we're looking at between an hour and an hour and a half. And then when they get more into the advanced stage of Alzheimer's disease, we're looking at probably 15 to 30 minutes maximum for the length of activities. We also want to provide plenty of rest periods for our loved one, give their brains a chance to recharge and rejuvenate themselves and be ready to take on the next task at hand. Now, when I talk about rest periods, I'm not saying that I think your loved one should be taking multiple naps throughout the day. If they need a nap, by all means, they should take a nap. But giving them that quiet time, those rest periods, quiet activities can be filled into that time. Maybe they really enjoy bird watching or their favorite TV show comes on at 2 o'clock, so instead of going to the doctor's appointment, we're watching the prices right now so they can recharge. Also, naps are beneficial, and when we talk about naps with Alzheimer's disease, we really encourage people to not nap in their bed. That can, when they wake up, um, cause them to become disoriented and think it's morning. And as we'll talk about later on with communication and Alzheimer's disease, if your loved one is insistent that it's morning at that point in time, and even though it's evening, you're going to be cooking breakfast and doing the morning routine with them. So really watch for indicators with your loved one. Most people with Alzheimer's, they're not going to be able to tell us verbally what's going on necessarily with them, but those nonverbals are really going to speak volumes to us. 
So look, if your loved one is getting more confused, if they're starting to ramp up with the agitation or the irritability, that could be their nonverbal sign to you that, hey, I'm getting a little bit worn out right now. I need a break. Another detour that we can take in avoiding fatigue is watching their caffeine intake. Really, after early afternoon, if caffeine is an issue for them, we don't want them to be consuming anymore. We also want to talk about following a routine, and we'll get into that one a little bit more when we talk about change. And then lastly, when we talk about fatigue, people with Alzheimer's obviously do need more rest periods. They will be sleeping more than other older adults. But keep in mind that excessive sleep could be a sign of, first of all, depression or also boredom. And so those are things that we really need to, if our loved one is sleeping more than we think they should be, keep those in mind. The second roadblock that we might run into with our loved one is that of change. And this can really be a barrier for someone with this disease. This happens again for a couple reasons. As this disease progresses, that intake of information that we keep talking about, the world really becomes less and less familiar to them. And so consistency is predictable and it is comfortable. It's something that they can understand and something they can rely on in a world that has become very unpredictable and very uncomfortable for them. So when we want to detour around that roadblock of change, what we really want to talk about is having a routine for that person. And now I'm not saying every day, day in and day out, you're doing the exact same activities over and over again. There can be a rhythm to that where weekly, every Thursday, we go to dinner with our friends. And every Saturday, we go to a movie. But generally speaking, you want to have a routine for that person that is predictable for them. So their morning routine is the same. We get up, we make the coffee, we read the paper, we have breakfast, and then we get on with different activities of the day. Another thing we need to talk about when we're addressing avoiding change with our loved ones is big events. And especially holidays can become very disorienting for someone with Alzheimer's disease. Just imagine if you were having trouble processing everything that was happening around you and now you have the holidays on top of it with music and lights and decorations and a big tree in the middle of the house as well. That can be very um, distressing for someone with this disease. So consider paring that down for them, not making it such a big event for them. Consider also how you spend your family time or how you have company during the holidays as well. Maybe we're not going to the big corporate Christmas party with hundreds of people there because it's not our loved one's best time of day and because they don't do as well in crowds anymore. So we start to accept invitations to smaller gatherings that'll be more manageable for them. Consider also when family comes to visit you. Consider scheduling them where just a few people come to visit your loved one at a given time and then giving them a rest period in between. A lot of times family members will be very well intentioned when they call you up on the phone and they say, you guys are stuck in the rut. You're doing the same routine over and over. You guys need a break. Come on and, and visit us and, and we'll get a break from that routine. And really that can send someone with Alzheimer's disease almost into a tailspin because that routine is just that important to them. Avoiding change, too, is not just these outward events that they're doing. We also want to talk about avoiding changing their environment as well. And I know a lot of times we consider moving when we're caring for someone with this disease, whether it be early on in the process and we're a couple and we're moving to a continuing care retirement community, or they're a little bit further advanced in the disease and they're moving into a memory care unit or a long-term care facility. But really be mindful of how can I minimize this change for this person? And so, for example, I love to cross-stitch. And when I get home at night and turn on the TV, if I want to cross-stitch, I know I can easily reach into the basket next to my chair and pull that cross-stitching out and start doing it. That's comfortable, that's predictable for me, and that's really what we need to consider for people who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. What are those natural tendencies that they have with this? Do they always reach to the side of their chair for the remote or the magazine? 
um, consider what is the painting that's been hanging above their couch for the past 40 years. When they move into a different place, we put that same picture over the couch in the living room for them to try to minimize that change. And then lastly, when we talk about avoiding change, we want to address travel as well. Now in the early stages and even into the moderate stages, it will really depend on the individual. Traveling is still definitely doable, but it's going to require a little bit more forethought on our part. So when we talk about travel, we just need to take into consideration a lot of the factors again. Whereas in the past, maybe we were looking for the cheapest airfare, now we need to reconsider that. We need to take into consideration their best time of day. Um, we need to find a flight that doesn't have any layovers. We need to communicate with the airline and say, hey, I need a wheelchair to get my loved one through this. And we need to go through the short TSA line so that we don't have to wait in line and potentially ramp up that anxiety in our loved one. So travel is definitely still doable. We just need to take some more things into consideration. Let's continue on talking about some of the common roadblocks that we see in individuals with Alzheimer's disease. Creating too much demand becomes another roadblock. Remember you learned earlier that information can simply be overwhelming. Again, it's not only what a person is hearing, but what they're seeing, maybe smelling or tasting. And that can become confusing and just simply overwhelming. Sometimes we often have unrealistic expectations. We think, well, they've always been able to do it. Why can't they do it now? And oftentimes we press individuals who are having troubles with memory and thinking to do things that simply they can no longer do. So we really have to begin to appreciate and respect that this is an individual who is doing the best they can. They are trying as hard as they can. And if we push them to try harder, they're only more likely to fail. And now we're going to be seeing some of those difficult behaviors like agitation that we didn't want to see. So let's talk about detours to avoiding too much demand. First of all, it's really important to be realistic. Again, what the person can do and what the person can't do. And we certainly want you to focus on the abilities that are left and not focus what is gone. But again, be realistic and accept and have changing ideas about how to create success in everyday life. The next thing that often creates a lot of demand that we can avoid having difficulty with is pre-announcing events. Oftentimes our good efforts are trying to tell someone, guess what, Johnny's coming to visit us in two weeks. Well, the person with memory and thinking problems, what's two weeks when they've lost all sense of time? So in fact, when we pre-announce, what we've ended up with is creating a lot of anxiety as we hear from this individual, when is Johnny coming, when is Johnny coming, about 20 times a day. So we really begin to think about what do we announce and when do we announce. And for some individuals, we're announcing right before the event's taking place. Now I know that sounds really difficult for you, particularly spouses, as we often hear them say, but I don't want to keep this information from my husband or my wife. I feel like I'm being devious. And yet I would suggest that if you pre-announce and they're asking repeated questions, actually you've inflicted anxiety when I know that wasn't your intention. But remember, their ability to handle that information simply has been lost. Again, we also want to announce or only tell the person what is necessary. I often find that I'm, when I'm working with individuals with Alzheimer's disease and their families, the families, again, are wanting to do their best, but are just giving way too much information. And the person is just struggling to keep up. And I think we all feel that way. The more that someone talks, it must really be important. And gee, if I can't understand what it is, I must be dumb. I must be really anxious. They must be keeping something from me and the effects really become negative. So we have to think about how to abbreviate our message. We want to be clear with them and certainly use good communication skills, but think about, you know, this is enough. I provided a very simple message that they're able to receive and be successful with. We do want to create positive moments, and we want to have activities that work. But as we think about that, we're thinking about how can we avoid failure or frustration Again, because failure or frustration is likely to lead to withdrawal, 
or perhaps some of these difficult behaviors like agitation or aggression or saying things that they normally wouldn't say. Let's look at another common roadblock that we've talked a little bit about already, and that is overwhelming or misleading stimuli. So you've already learned that the brain's ability to interpret information has become damaged. Not only perhaps taking in verbal under information and perhaps trying to decode it and understand it, but sometimes even what we see and understanding what we see and how we see it might be misinterpreted. For example, one might be watching television and think that what is happening on the TV is actually happening in the home. That would be an example of a misleading stimuli. So as we look at detours to avoiding overwhelming or misleading stimuli, I want you to consider these things. As was talked about earlier with holiday gatherings, big events, we want to think about social functions. We want to think about limiting the number of people. So perhaps your family get-togethers, which might have been eight people, now are more successful with four. We want to consider having a buddy. So let's say we plan to go to dinner with our family. The buddy is not you. You as the caregiver should get the night off so that you can enjoy other people. However, if we don't assign a buddy, which could be perhaps the daughter or maybe a grandchild, they're not likely to engage that person at all and your person is likely to withdraw or perhaps become very rude and say, I'm out of here. So assigning a buddy to kind of keep that person engaged in discussion will really be helpful. Again, if we see this person getting irritable and perhaps not acting in a way that's acceptable and they say, I want to leave, you honor their wish to leave and leave immediately. On the other hand, if the person doesn't want to leave, then you make the excuse and say, I'm sorry to say, I'm not feeling well, I really need to go, and then apologize as you leave the event. Oftentimes in the middle stage of the illness, particularly late in the evening, people will also complain about seeing and hearing things that aren't there. Remember, the brain is failing. It's having a very difficult time trying to remember. So perhaps the couple has a cat and the cat has just knocked off the plant, off the shelf. Well, I forgot that I had a, a cat and the plant was sitting up on a shelf. And so as I hear this noise, and I'm the person with Alzheimer's disease, I'm likely to say, someone just broke in our home. So again, what I see and how I perceive it might be very different. So you as caregivers need to become the person's detective. We're going to ask you to remove distraction. If the TV is on, shut it off. Again, this is a time to eliminate those kinds of things that people might misperceive. Perhaps if your loved one is talking about a person who is deceased, like they're living, it could be that there's a picture that's prominently displayed. Simply removing the picture made that misinterpretation go away. For some individuals, we need to think about covering the windows at night. Again, pulling the drapes or closing the shutters because with this memory loss, the person might see a reflection of themselves and yet with their regressed memory loss, who they see in that reflection, whether it be in the glass or be in the mirror, might not be who they remember. And I think most of us will agree that we look notably different as we get older compared to when we were younger. So we want to think about covering mirrors if the person walks into the bathroom and immediately leaves. They likely misinterpreted that someone was in the bathroom that is themselves to be a stranger. And if it's a man, he's likely to go in only so many times and then go urinate in a closet, in a waste can, or perhaps in a corner. The woman's likely to become incontinent. And this was simply because misinterpretation perhaps of self. So again, your role as a partner in care is to become the detective. And it's important to remember, never argue with the person. Don't try to reality orient them. It's not going to work. Rather, provide lots of love, lots of reassurance, and use a good bowl of ice cream to provide a nice distraction. Another roadblock that we're going to run into as our loved one is progressing through Alzheimer's disease is that of communication. And by now that we've gone through all of these various roadblocks, I'm sure you've noticed how very intertwined they are. And communication especially seems to touch on every single roadblock. If we're not able to communicate or understand 
what someone's saying to us, um, it can a lot of, lead to a lot of challenges. So we have some communication don'ts that we really encourage people to follow. We don't want to correct the person, convince them or coerce them. And usually when I say this with an in-person audience, you get a lot of snickers and laughter when you say things like that because that's a natural part of communication. These communication techniques that we're going to share with you require a lot of practice because how we normally communicate on a day-to-day -day basis is now going to have to change. So if someone pre presents us with wrong information, our natural inclination is to say, no, no, that's not correct. This is the right answer. But that's, if you haven't experienced it, is going to cause a lot of problems. The other things that we need to avoid doing are reasoning with our loved one and arguing. I have never known someone to win an argument with someone with Alzheimer's disease. So it's best just to not even try. And the last don't that we have is don't ask yes, no questions if you're not willing to accept no as an answer. Now, a lot of times those closed-ended questions are ideal for people with Alzheimer's disease because a multitude of choices can become overwhelming for them. But a yes-no question can also be ideal unless no is not an acceptable answer. Do you want to go take a shower? No. And if that happens now, what are we going to do? We're going to correct, we're going to convince, we're going to coerce, and they're going to become agitated with us for trying to do that. So yes and no, only if no is an acceptable answer. So what can we do to communicate still with our loved ones? A great technique that we use all the time is agree, apologize, distract. So for example, if your loved one comes up to you in a panic, I have lost my purse, I can't find my purse anywhere. Well, you know she hasn't carried a purse in the past two years. Agree, apologize, distract with our loved one. I am so sorry that you have lost your purse. I would feel panicked if I was in your shoes. I'm going to help you with this situation. I'm going to help you find it, but first, I really need to go get the mail. Will you help me with that? So we've agreed with that statement. We've validated what she's feeling right now. We've apologized if we've done anything wrong, and then we distract them. We bring their attention to something that is not causing them to be upset. Another good technique that we can do is just play dumb. If they say something to us that's completely off the wall, oh really? I didn't know that. Isn't that interesting? Another technique that we share with people is the yes but technique. If you have finally convinced your loved one to stop driving, which oftentimes is a very difficult task for family members, and once you finally get those keys away or the license has expired, whatever has happened, your loved one can become fixated on it and say, I need to get my license renewed. Let's go to the DMV. Well, if we introduce the yes but, we don't want to say no to them because then they'll become agitated at us for it. But if we introduce yes but, yes, we do need to go to the DMV. But you know what? I just got off the phone with them and there's a four hour wait right now. Maybe we could hold off until tomorrow. So now we've distracted them off to something else. Yes, you have a fantastic idea, but we can't do it right at this moment. Another great technique we can use is respond to the emotion. A lot of times when someone with Alzheimer's is talking to us, they will say things that aren't accurate in our reality. What is accurate in both realities is the emotion behind what they're feeling. The example I gave earlier of the woman who lost her purse, it doesn't matter that she never had a purse. She is feeling panicked and beside herself at this moment. So that's exactly what we need to address in her is the emotion that she's feeling. Give her empathy and understanding for what she's going through at that moment. We also need to speak simply and speak clearly with our loved ones. We don't need to throw in every flowery adjective that we can come up with to express ourselves anymore. We need to say what we mean and mean exactly what we say. So a great example of that is, why don't you hop in the shower? We know what we have asked our loved one to do. We want them to go take a shower. But in an Alzheimer's brain, that phrase could be misinterpreted where we are literally asking them to hop into the shower. We also need to become comfortable with silence, something that we're not very good at in today's society. 
It almost seems when we're faced with silence, we just naturally want to fill it in with more words. But more words can add to more confusion in our loved ones. It is just going to take them longer to process that information, to process what you've just told them or what you've just asked them. And so giving them a moment to process what you've said, come up with a response, and get that response to come back out of their mouth. They'll be much more able to do it if they have some silent time to actually do it rather than trying to interpret what you're saying to them through the entire time. Another good technique is therapeutic fibbing. Therapeutic fibbing is a fantastic technique in Alzheimer's disease because it's sparing them details or changing information that could be upsetting to them. Lastly, we want to talk about practice, practice, practice. As I mentioned just a few minutes ago, these are new techniques and they're not natural ways that we are used to communicating. So we're not going to get them right all the time. Lastly, we absolutely need to maintain a sense of humor. In communication, we also want to talk about allowing the person to talk about their illness. You well know that Alzheimer's disease is not an easy disease for anybody involved to deal with. And if your loved one comes to you and wants to talk to you about what it is they're experiencing, we really need to allow them the safety to do that with us, to provide that comfort, to provide that sense of security and that reassurance to them. Lastly, another major part of communication is nonverbal communication. On this slide here, I just think it's absolutely incredible when it gets laid out in graph form like this. Body language accounts for 55% of the message that we receive from someone. Pitch and tone is another 38%. That makes a verbal, the words that you are choosing to use, only 7% of the message that someone gets from us. And that's in cognitively healthy adults. Now, if we're dealing with someone with dementia who has damage to that communication center in their brain, that nonverbal communication is going to become that much more important. It's pretty hard to be mad at someone who just has a beaming smile on their face when they come up and greet you. It's fantastic to see you today. I really am looking forward to all the things we're gonna to do together. And being natural and open with that person, that message is going to transfer to them as well. Let's explore the next roadblock, and that would be activities. While activities certainly are an important part of our lives, let's face it, as a caregiver, the last thing you want to do is become the, the activities director. And you know, by now you've experienced, my person has no initiative, no get up and go, it's long gone and went, he doesn't want to do anything, all she cares to do is watch TV all day. So lack of initiative is an important feature in Alzheimer's disease. As we stated earlier, that executive function, that ability to initiate and to be able to sequence, a lot of the steps take place in activities just become really difficult. So it's easier, quite honestly, to sit in a chair and watch TV and take a nap. So boredom tends to be a pretty common theme that we see as a roadblock. So let's explore what are some detours that we can use to lead towards more pleasurable activities. Well, first of all, activities is a really broad term. So what a pleasurable activity means to you is likely very different for me. And you know, as a caregiver, I might have very different activities than my husband had throughout my life. Or perhaps it's as a daughter caring for my mother. You know, I never really got involved with her activities. So it becomes kind of difficult. So we need to really begin to break down and try to appreciate what activities might work for the person we're caring for. Well, a great place to begin is thinking back or trying to connect with others, perhaps, who were friends with your mother. What were her lifelong preferences? What does it mom like to do? So maybe we learned that she liked to play cards. And while bridge maybe isn't possible now, maybe playing a game of solitaire might work for her if we introduce it to her. So we really want to begin to explore what have been her lifelong preferences and her interests and go from there. But also keep in mind that people with dementia often forget what they weren't interested in. So perhaps in the past they would have said, no, that's just silly, I would never do that. 
Now we can introduce an activity such as creating art where the person forgets that they were bad at art. They were told they were bad at art. They had no interest and now we introduce it and they actually enjoy it. We want to think about alternating quieting activities with those that are more stimulating. So for example, going out to lunch with a friend would be a wonderful activity, but pretty fatiguing as we talked about before. Perhaps there was a lot of chit chatting that went over over the lunch period and now this individual comes home and they're really quite fatigued. But rather than taking a nap, perhaps a quieting activity like here's a magazine. It just came today. Why don't you leaf through it and see if you see some new recipes? You know the person's not going to find a recipe, but it's an activity that's familiar and really quite comforting. So we want to think about balancing those quiet activities with too much activity, as we said, that will lead to overwhelm that will likely come back later in the day. So factoring those rest periods will really be important. Do you see a theme here, how all of these roadblocks interrelate? Likewise, we want to be prepared to adapt the activity as the disease progresses. So I like to use golf as an activity. Well, I like to golf. But 18 holes, wow, that's four hours. And you've learned by now that four hours is a lot of time, even in early stage Alzheimer's disease. So perhaps suggesting or making a tea time just for nine holes is enough. As the disease progresses, and playing nine holes is even difficult because now the person's losing track of their score. They can't find their ball. It's creating frustration for them or maybe even for their golf partner. So perhaps now we begin to putt on the green or just go get a small bucket of balls for the driving range. The great thing about television is just about everything's covered. So the Golf Channel might become a new way to introduce golf for somebody with more moderate to advancing disease and talk about the golf. Not so much about who the players are or perhaps the rules of the game, but my, isn't that just a beautiful hole? Gee, do you think you could get out of that sand trap? So engaging in a discussion can be, become fun. And finally, with somebody with very advanced dementia, getting a picture book of golf can work because we've all learned that a picture's worth a thousand words. So you've learned that words don't work, but images do. So that's a great example of how you can adapt an activity to meet the changing needs of the person with dementia. We often find, again, that it's very difficult as a family member to have to try to engage the person in pleasurable activities. Again, you learned if you're not excited, they're not excited. If you say, hey, let's go out to dinner, and they see that you're feeling kind of frustrated or looking angry, as you've just learned, they're likely to say, no thanks. So again, if we can't be excited about the activity, perhaps we need to look elsewhere. You know, by the moderate stage of the illness, I really work with families to think about engaging or enrolling their loved one in an adult day health care program. These day programs are really terrific. They're social settings that are based on very structured and predictable activities, provide meal time, and really accommodate the person to have a good time and the family member to get a break. If that doesn't work for your loved one, hiring a companion through a home care agency can also be very effective. Again, the goal of the companion is to occupy that person, to take them out, to do some things or do activities in the home, allowing pleasure for the person and a respite break for you as the caregiver. Most importantly, in any activity for us, even without dementia, the goal of any activity is to have fun. We really want to focus on the pleasure of doing versus how good it turns out. So think about that in your loved one. Don't judge the final product. Rather look at did they enjoy the time that they were engaged in a certain activity. Let's now shift to the final roadblock, and that is that of illness. So you've already learned that these diseases that take a toll on the brain are very difficult. We talked about how chronic conditions, if not controlled, can also add to more confusion. Well, in fact, sometimes it's really difficult to understand if something new is taking place. So we try to cue in families to think about understanding that a sudden change in behavior, in confusion, or perhaps all of a sudden seeing things that aren't there, hallucinating, signal that something is wrong. And we're often talking these changes occur over hours to days. So this becomes a medical emergency from our perspective, and we call this sudden change in memory and thinking 
delirium. Very different than dementia, which is kind of slow progressing. So some detours and things to consider if you think illness is striking. One, consider, might this person be dehydrated? And in fact, often what we see is that people with dementia don't drink as much fluids as they did in the past. Oftentimes families will say, well, I put a big glass of fluid by the chair, but it's just sitting there all day. Well, the person has forgotten how to initiate taking a sip from the cup. Again, dehydration can happen and cause pretty significant sudden confusion. Likewise, kind of hand in hand, if people aren't drinking enough, they're more prone to bladder infections, urinary tract infections. And oftentimes, nurses who are working in long-term care facilities, when they see a sudden change in this person's mental status and their confusion, the first thing they'll do is call the doctor and say, may we get a urine sample to send off to the laboratory, thinking it's likely a urinary tract infection. People with advanced dementia, however, could have pain. Perhaps they could have had a fracture that just happened by itself, and they have no other way to signal that they hurt. And now, all of a sudden, there's increased confusion. Again, your role as a detective, and certainly if you can't figure it out, um, getting with your doctor can be very helpful. Likewise, something new for us is this idea that we have to keep track of bowel movements. Again, somebody with moderate dementia now might forget, and perhaps with the lack of fluid and perhaps not eating enough fiber, they're not having those regular bowel movements in the past, and all of a sudden they're constipated. And what do we see? We see increased confusion. Finally, medications can play havoc for people, especially older, frailer people with memory problems. So whenever a new medication started, and you see a sudden change in memory and thinking or increased confusion, it's really important to be suspect of that medication. In any of these situations, your primary action is to call your primary care provider. You probably don't want to call your memory loss specialist because it's likely not to be Alzheimer's disease, rather another chronic condition that your primary care doctor is going to be expert at treating. Well, we're ending our presentation now talking about directions that you as caregivers need to learn in caring for your loved one. We hope that you found this class to be helpful. We've learned from our family caregivers that in fact it takes a lot of time to learn these new strategies. We can't just hear it once. Oftentimes we have to hear it three or four times. So we invite you to listen to the program again. We hope that you find those segments, maybe that are most of interest to you because this is the roadblock that you've now encountered, that you'll visit that segment and continue to review this information and kind of rethink your strategies. We'd also encourage you to share this program with other family members and friends so that you can all have a similar understanding and perhaps develop some consistent approaches that you can use with your loved one. Finally, we invite you to visit our website at banneralz.org to get connected, learn more about the additional educational programs that we offer on site as well as through webinar. You can get signed up for our monthly newsletter, and you can learn how to be involved in our prevention treatments as well as some of the clinical trials for people with dementia. We wish you every success as you learn new skills to care for your person with dementia.